reading a select passage for your enjoyment today. So sit back, relax, and get comfy. Right. Today we are reading Eureka, an essay material and spiritual universe. It is with humility really unassumed. It is with a sentiment even of awe that I pen the opening sentence of this work. For of all conceivable subjects, I approach the reader with the most solemn, the most comprehensive, the most difficult, the most august. What terms shall I find sufficiently simple in their sublimity, sufficiently sublime in their simplicity? For the mere enunciation of my theme, I design to speak of the physical, metaphysical, and mathematical of the material and spiritual universe, of its essence, its origin, its creation, its present condition and its destiny. I shall be so rash, moreover, as to challenge the conclusions and thus in effect to question the sagacity of many of the greatest and most justly reverenced of men. In the beginning, let me as distinctly as possible announce not the theorem which I hope to demonstrate, for whatever the mathematicians may assert, there is in this world at least no such thing as demonstration, but the ruling idea which Throughout this volume, I shall be continually endeavoring to suggest. My general proposition then is this. In the original unity of the first thing lies the secondary cause of all things, with the germ of their inevitable annihilation. An illustration of this idea, I propose to take such a survey of the universe that the mind may be able really to receive and to perceive an individual impression. Here from the top of Aetna casts his eyes leisurely around, is affected chiefly by the extent and diversity of the scene. Only by a rapid whirling on his heel could he ever hope to comprehend the panorama in the sublimity of its oneness. But as on the summit of Hitna, no man has thought of whirling on his heel, so no man has ever taken into his brain the full uniqueness of the prospect. And so, again, whatever considerations lie involved in this uniqueness have as yet no practical existence for mankind. I 
do not know a treatise in which a survey of the universe, using the word in its most comprehensive and only legitimate acceptation, is taken at all, and it may as well be here to mention that by the term universe, wherever employed, without qualification in this essay, I mean to designate the utmost conceivable expanse of space with all things spiritual and material that can be imagined to exist within the compass of that expanse. In speaking of what is ordinarily implied by the expression universe, I shall take a phrase of limitation the universe of stars. Why this distinction is considered necessary will be seen in the sequel. But even of treatises on the really limited, although always assumed as the unlimited universe of stars, I know none in which a survey even of this limited universe is so taken as to warrant deductions from its individuality. The nearest approach to such a work is made in the cosmos of Alexander von Humboldt. He presents the subject, however, not in its individuality, but in its generality. His theme, in its last result, is the law of each portion of the merely physical universe, as this law is related to the laws of every other portion of this merely physical universe. His design is simple and synoretical, in a word, he discusses the universality of material relation and discloses to the eye of philosophy whatever inferences have hitherto lain hidden behind this universality. But however admirable be the succinctness with which he is treated each particular point of his topic. The mere multiplicity of these points occasions necessarily an amount of detail and thus an involution of idea which preclude all individuality of impression. It seems to me that in aiming at the latter effect and through it at the consequences, the conclusions, the suggestions, the speculations. Or, if nothing better offer itself, the mere guesses which may result from it, we require something like a mental gyration on the heel. We need so rapid a revolution of all things about the central point of sight that while the minutiae vanish altogether, even the more conspicuous objects become blended into one. Among the vanishing minutiae in a survey of this kind would be all exclusively terrestrial matters. The earth would be considered in its planetary relations alone. A man in this view becomes mankind, mankind a member of the cosmical family of intelligences. And now, before proceeding to our subject proper, let me beg the reader's attention to an extract, to an extract or two from a 
somewhat remarkable letter which appears to have been found corked in a bottle and floating on the Mare Tenenbaum, an ocean well described by the Nubian geographer Ptolemy Hefsian, but little frequented in modern days unless by the transcendentalists, some other divers for crotchets. The date of this letter, I confess, surprises me even more particularly than its contents, for it seems to have been written in the year 2848. As for the passengers I am about to transcribe, they, I fancy, will speak for themselves. Do you know, my dear friend, says the writer, addressing no doubt, contemporary. Do you know that it is scarcely more than eight or nine hundred years ago since the metaphysicians first consented to relieve the people of the singular fancy that there exists but two practical roads to truth? Believe it if you can. It appears, however, that a long, long ago, in the night of time, there lived a Turkish philosopher Arias, and surnamed Tottle. Here, possibly, the letter writer means Aristotle. The best names were wretchedly corrupted in two or three thousand years. The fame of this great man depended mainly upon his demonstration that sneezing is a natural provision by means of which over profound thinkers are enabled to expel superfluous ideas that through the nose but he obtained a scarcely less valuable celebrity as the founder relevance as a principal propagator of what was termed the deductive or a priori philosophy. He started with what he maintained to be axioms or simple evident truths, and the now well understood fact that no truths are self evident really does make in the slightest degree, really does not make in the slightest degree against his speculations. It was sufficient for his purpose that the truths in question were evident at all. From axioms he proceeded logically to results. His most illustrious disciples were one Tuklet Achimotrician, meaning useless, and one Kant, a Dutchman, the originator of that species of transcendentalism which, with the change merely of a C for a K, now bears his peculiar name. Well, Aries total flourish supreme until the advent of one hog, surnamed the Ettrick Shepherd, who preached an entirely different system, which he called the A posteriori or inductive. His plan referred altogether to sensation. He proceeded by observing, analyzing, and classifying facts. Instantiae naturae, as they were somewhat affectedly called, and arranging them into general laws. In a word, while well, the mode of Ares rested on noumena, that of Hawk depended on phenomena, and so great was the admiration excited by this latter system that, at its first introduction, Ares fell into general disrepute. Finally, however, he recovered ground was permitted to divide the empire philosophy of his more modern rival. The savants contending themselves with proscribing all other competitors, past, present, and to come, putting an end 
to all controversy on the topic by promulgation of a median law to the effect that the Aristotelian and Baconian roads are and of right ought to be the sole possible avenues to knowledge. Baconian, you must know, my dear friend, adds the letter writer at this point, was an adjective invented as equivalent to Hogian, and at the same time more dignified and euphonious. Now I do assure you most positively, proceeds the epistle, that I represent these matters fairly. You can easily understand how restrictions so absurd on their very face must have operated in those days to retard the progress of true science, which makes its most important advances, as all history will show, by seemingly intuitive leaps. These ancient ideas confined investigation to crawling and I need not suggest to you that crawling, among varieties of locomotion, is a very capital thing of its kind. But because the tortoise is sure of foot, for this reason we must clip the wings of the eagles. For many centuries so great was the infatuation about Hulk especially, that a virtual stop was put to all thinking. so called. No man dared utter a truth for which he felt himself indebted to his soul alone. It mattered not whether the truth was even demonstrably such for the dogmatizing philosophers of that epic were regarded as the only road by which it was professed to have been attained. The end with them was a point of no moment whatsoever, the means they vociferated. Let us look at the means. And if, on the scrutiny of the means, it was found to come neither under the category Hogue nor under the category Aries, why then the savants were no farther but calling the thinker a fool and branding him a theorist would never thenceforward have anything to do with him or with his truths. Now, my friend, continues the letter writer, it cannot be maintained that by the crawling system exclusively adopted, men would arrive at the maximum amount of truth, even in any long series of ages. For the repression of imagination was an evil not to be counterbalanced, even by absolute certainty in the snail process. But their certainty was far from absolute. The error of our progenitors is quite analogous with that of the wise who fancies he must necessarily see an object the more distinctly, the more closely he holds it to his eyes. They blinded themselves too with the impalpable, titillating scotch snuff of detail, and thus the boasted facts of the Hogites were by no means always facts point of little importance, but for the assumption that they always were. The vital taint, however, in Baconianism is its most lamentable fount of error, lay in its tendency to throw power and consideration into the hands of merely perceptive men, of those intertritonic minnows, the microscope savants, the diggers and peddlers of minute facts. For the most part in physical science, facts, all of which they retailed at the same price upon the highway, their value depending, it was supposed, simply on the fact of their fact, without reference 
to their applicability or inapplicability to the development of those ultimate and only legitimate facts called law. Then the persons, let her go on to say, then the persons are suddenly elevated by the Hogan philosophy to a station for which they were unfitted, thus transferred from the sculleries to the parlors of science, from its pantries into its pulpits. Then these individuals are more intolerant, a more intolerable set of bigots and tyrants never existed on the face of the earth. Their creed, their text, and their sermon were alike the one word of fact. But for the most part, even of this one word, they knew not even the meaning. On those who ventured to disturb their facts with the view of putting them in order and to use, the disciples of Hoag had no mercy whatever. All attempts at generalization were met at once by the words theoretical, theory, theorist. All thought, to be brief, was very properly resented as a personal affront to themselves, cultivating the natural sciences to the exclusion of the metaphysics, the mathematics, and logic. Many of these bacon and engendered philosophers, one idea one-sided, the lame of a leg, were more wretchedly helpless, more miserably ignorant, in view of all the comprehensible objects of knowledge, than the veriest unlettered hind who proves that he knows something at least, in admitting that he knows absolutely nothing. Nor had our forefathers any better right to talk about certainty when pursuing in blind confidence the a priori path of axioms or of the Ram. At innumerable points this path was scarcely as straight as a ram's horn. The simple truth is that the Aristotelians erected their castles on a basis far less reliable than air, for no such things as axioms ever existed, or could possibly exist at all. This they must have been very blind indeed not to see, or at least to suspect, for and even in their own day, many of their long admitted axioms had been abandoned. Ex nihilo nihil fit, for example, and a thing cannot act where it is not, and there cannot be an antipodes, and a darkness cannot proceed from light. These and numerous similar propositions formally accepted without hesitation as axioms or undeniable truths were, even at a period of which I speak, seem to be altogether untenable. How absurd in these people then to persist in relying upon a basis as immutable, whose mutability has become so repeatedly manifest. But even through evidence afforded by themselves against themselves, it is easy to convict these a priori reasoners of their grossest unreason. It is easy to show the futility, the impalpability of their axioms in general. I have now lying before me, it will be observed that we still proceed with the letter, I have now lying before me a book printed about a thousand years ago, Pundit assures me that it is decidedly the cleverest ancient work on its topic, which is logic. The author, who was much esteemed in his day, was one miller or a mill, and we find it recorded of him as a point of some importance that he rode a mill horse whom he called Jeremy Bentham. But let us glance at the volume itself. Ah, ability or inability to conceive, says Mr. Mill very properly, is in no case to be received as a criterion of axiomatic truth. Now that this is palpable, truism 
no one in his senses would deny. Not to admit the proposition is to insinuate a charge of variability in truth itself. Whose very title is a synonym of the steadfast. If ability to conceive to be taken as criterion of truth, then a truth to David Hume would be very seldom. little query there's but one response. I defy any living man to invent a second. The sole answer is this, because we find it impossible to conceive that a tree can be anything else than a tree or not a tree. This, I repeat, is Mr. Mill's sole answer. He will not pretend to suggest another. And yet, by his own showing, his answer is clearly no answer at all, for he has not already required us to admit as an axiom that ability or inability to conceive is in no case to be taken as a criterion of axiomatic truth. Thus all 
absolutely all. His argumentation is at sea without a rudder. Let it not be urged that an exception from the general rule is to be made in cases where the impossibility to conceive is so peculiarly great as when we are called upon to conceive a tree both a tree and not a tree. Let no attempt, I say, be made at urging this scepticism, scepticism, for in the first place there are no degrees of impossibility, and thus no impossible conception can be more peculiarly impossible than another impossible conception. In the second place, Mr. Mill himself, no doubt, after thorough deliberation, has most distinctly and most rationally excluded all opportunity for exception by the emphasis of his proposition that in no case is ability or inability to conceive to be taken as criterion of axiomatic truth. In the third place, even were exceptions admissible at all, it remains to be shown how any exception is admissible here, that a tree can be both a tree and not a tree. It's an idea which the angels or the devils may entertain, which no doubt may an earthly bedlamite or transcendentalist does. Now I do not quarrel with these ancients, continues the letter writer, so much on the account of the transparent frivolity of their logic, which to be plain was baseless, worthless, and fantastic altogether, as on account of their pompous and infatuate proscription of all other roads to truth than the two narrow and crooked paths, the one of creeping, the other of crawling, to which in their ignorant perversity they have dared to confine the soul, the soul which loves nothing so well as to soar in these regions of illimitable intuition, which are utterly incognizant of path.